man. Hope everybody's well tonight. Well, we just seen a bunch that wasn't. Seems like it's always like that, though. Romans 10, 17, we're going to start out with another prayer. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we're going to be in the word of God. 1 Corinthians 2, 14 says, a natural man cannot receive the things of the spirit of God for their foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. We're going to look at a few questions tonight about somebody has asked, and, and Brother Keith asked me to address some questions, and it got too long, and so we're going to do the second half next week. So not every one of these questions are from non-believers. The biggest problem is not with atheists, agnostics, doubters, Wiccans is with religious people. You cannot debate religion. There's a difference between religion and a relationship. It's a matter of about 18 inches. Having a heart knowledge of Jesus Christ and being born again. Having him in here. So, and if you want to see, just go and read Matthew 23, where Jesus says, I think seven or eight times, Woe to you, scribes, you Pharisees, you hypocrites. So his biggest problem was not with the atheists, the doubters, the Wiccans. I mean, all he did was cast them out. So in Matthew 7, 21 says, um, let's look at it. It's escaped me right now. It's one of my memory verses, though. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. So we have to be real careful. And then if you look at, at Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. Let me start over. Because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way which leads to life and there are few who find it. Okay, let's look at Ephesians. Can you lose your salvation? Let's turn to Ephesians. Well, let's pray. Dear Heavenly, oh, never mind. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, Lord. Calm me down right now, Lord. I need you. Fill me with your spirit. Help me to get through this, Lord. And, uh, just lead me, guide me, and direct me in this, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Sorry about that, guys. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. Can you lose your salvation? A lot of people have come up to the booth and asked me this question. And I don't like to debate in the booth because it's not about debate. I'm there to uh, preach the gospel to people, get them saved. So in, in uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verses 13 and 14, it says, In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom, also having believed, you were sealed. So he says, You were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is a guarantee of the inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession, to the praise of his glory. But we're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Let's look at 2 Timothy 1.12. 2 Timothy 1.12. Same subject. For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. For I know whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him until that day. You know that song, don't you? 
Okay. So, let's look at John. Chapter 10, verse 27. 10, 27, John. So we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. John 10, 27. He says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. So, that verse alone right there, we're in his hand. Nobody is able to snatch them out of his hand. All right? Philippians 1 6. Being confident in this very thing, he has begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Now there's some more verses, but I picked these up. Just to let you see, it's eternal life. He says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, who shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, if you had something and you lost it in 10 years, it wasn't everlasting. Well, they say, well, they lost it. They walked away from the faith. Let's look at 1 John 2, 19. 1 John 2, 19. He says, they went out from us. But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might be made manifest that none of them were of us. They didn't have it in the first place. Okay. And they say, well, some people say, well, you can lose it from, by your sin. Well, if that's the case, I've done lost it. But in 1 John 1, 9, he says, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. There's an interesting thing here. Let's look at John. Uh, let me see. John, 1 John 5.13, since we're here. 5.13. These things I have written to you, believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. So who do you write this book to? He wrote it to believers. And then in 1 John says, if you say you have not sinned, verse 10, you make him out to be a liar and his word has no place in you. So, and another thing about this, look at this, this. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know. So he wrote this book, wrote this book <laughs> that you may know that you have eternal life. Something interesting. If you go to John 20, verses 30 and 31. 20 verses 30 and 31. He writes something similar. In 30 it says, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples that are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So he wrote John, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. He wrote 1 John for your eternal, so, so you know your salvation. You may know you have eternal life. That's pretty interesting on those two. Testimony, there's a, there's this, this is not mine. I heard it, but I wanted to use it. It's always intrigued me. I uh, was a missionary in a foreign country, and he was out handing out New Testament Bibles. He handed this guy on the street. And he looked at it, and he said, man, that's some good paper. And he handed it back to him. He said, he said no, I can't accept it because I know what I'll do with it. I'm going to use it as cigarette paper. And the missionary looked at him. He said, I tell you what. He said, as long as you read it first. He said, I don't mind. He said, if you promise me you'll read it first, I'll give you the Bible. He said, okay. So about two years later, he was at this revival meeting. And this guy got up and he was giving testimonies that night. He said, man, this guy looks familiar. And he says, hmm. So 
he got up on stage and he started giving this testimony about this missionary. He gave him a New Testament Bible. He said, and he said, I told him what I was going to do with it. He said, that I was going to use it for cigarette paper. He said, but if you promised me to read it, he said, he didn't care. He said, because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So he said, I smoke Matthew. I smoke more. I smoke Luke. He said, I got to John 3.16. He said, you know you can't smoke John 3.16. And he received Christ as his Lord and Savior. And I thought, I've always, that, that testimony has always struck me. And so, let's look at the next. Jesus plus anything. Anything. Y'all have to excuse me tonight. Jesus plus anything. No. Titus 3.5. Be first Thessalonians, second Timothy, and then Titus. Three, five. It says, not by works of righteousness. So there's your righteousness, which you have done. But according to his mercy, he saved us through what? The washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. That's how you're saved. It's not by baptism. Now I can tell you. If you've been saved, you're going to want to be baptized if you've been saved because he's commanded us to. But it's not about good works and or baptism. He saved us by the washing of reduce, rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. And people come up and argue about the law. Drop down to verse 9. He says, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions, and what? Striving about the law. For they are unprofitable and useless. He says, reject the device of men after the first and second admonition. Knowing that such a person is warped in sinning, being self-condemned. So don't strive about the law or genealogies. It's not what it's about. It's about the new birth. Okay, Evolution. There's no evidence for evolution. Evolution is a, a change in one from one kind to the other. Now, we have animals that have adaptation. They adopt to their environment and make changes there. But no evidence from, from one kind to another. What you can do, there's uh, that www.livingwaters.com, that uh, evolution versus God. He's got all kind of movies. This is Ray Comfort in the way of the master. He's got them on Atheist, Evolution, several different ones. They're real good movies. I'd go if you wanted to know a subject, and he covers it pretty good there. And you can watch a movie on it. And it's free. You can pull it up on your computer and watch it. Okay, let's move on. Oh, now i got to give his testimony. And this is controversy. I had to call Brother Keith and see if I could share this. It wasn't, I don't know. It happened. I'm not necessarily proud of it, but I'm not ashamed of it either. I was at the courthouse and uh, doing, again, you may have heard that testimony about the guy at the courthouse in the cafeteria that received Christ. Well, this one didn't work out too good. And so I, I get there that morning about 8 and go up the second floor on Monday, and they have courtrooms all the way around the second floor, five, six courtrooms. And so they have 150 people. They got lawyers and defendants sitting out in front of these courtrooms. So I, I didn't put together a bunch of tracks, and I'm walking around handing them out. I got about 75 people down and started over across the back. I handed this to one guy. He said, what's this? I said, it's about Jesus and salvation. And he said, I don't want that. He handed it back to me. And he said, I don't appreciate you handing that out. And so I handed it to the lady next to him, and she took it. And so I took a step over here, and I was fixing to hand another one out, and he pulled his shirt up. He said, you see this? This is a star of Satan. He said, I'm a Satanist. I said, oh, okay. So then I hand one again to the guy next to him, her, or whatever, him, her. Anyway, he pulls his sleeve up then. He said, and this is a, a tattoo of something to do with Satan. And I stepped back over in front of him. I said, okay. I said, so you believe in evolution? He said, yeah. He said, well, 
I said, who did you descend from? He said, apes. I said, well, you ought to know your relatives better than I do. Boy, when I said that, he blew up. He stood up and he started raising Cain. And I said, ooh, I took a took couple steps back. I said, I was just agreeing with you. You're the one that said it. And about that time, he took off and he went over to a bailiff. Was it one standing outside one of the courtrooms? Started talking to him. Well, I just kept on going, passing out tracks. And I got down, hit, and I looked back, and another cop was with him. And then another bailiff joined him. I said, oh, oh, here we go. So I'm down there at the other end, and, and about that time I hear somebody, there he is down there. And I was about from here to the do front door from him. And so he comes down and starts talking to me. He said, the bailiff, he said, no, you can't be handing them out in here. Well, there was a lawyer sitting with a defendant right here by us. She got up and walked over. She's like this. And she goes, and I said, well, I'm a Christian. I said, Jesus goes where I go. I said, y'all call me down here for jury duty. I said, you'll have to do what you have to do. And so he said, well, I'll ask you not to pass them out. I said, okay, until this settles off. I said, but I'm not the problem. I'm not the one that's up screaming and hollering and ranting and raving. And so, and I told him what happened. So he turns around and goes back down to the other end. Well, now, this guy, he's going to, he's done got irate with the cops and the bailiffs. They finally had to escort him out of the building. And they, oh, you could hear him all the way downstairs, through the lobby and out. And, uh, but why did that happen? I, now, I think it hurt a little bit, but it also helped people too. I mean, but it's just the way it happened. You're going to run into these people. If you get out there witnessing, you're going to run into the atheists and Wiccans. You're not going to get away from it. Jesus said they persecuted me. Don't think they're not going to persecute you. False prophets. Let's look at uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18. Twenty-one and twenty-two. And if you say in your heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord has spoken, has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. I run into a, some uh, Mormons in the, in the park. And, uh, and I ask him that very question because he prophesies a lot of things that didn't come true. If you know who I'm talking about. And so you have to be careful. Jesus says you'll know a false prophet because their prophecies doesn't come true. <clears throat> Look back at verse 20. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that prophet shall die. Well, I'm not going there, but just remember, when you hear a prophecy from somebody and it doesn't come to pass, that's not the thing from the Lord. He doesn't make mistakes. Catholic lady. There was a Catholic lady that come up to the booth at the Strawberry Festival. She went through the board. And she said, well, she said, you know, there's some questions I had about our religion. She said, I got my own Bible a couple years ago and I've been reading it. She said, and some things just don't line up with our religion. But you can't get into a confrontation with other religions. <clears throat> what you have to do is get around the intellect to the real problem. It's the heart and the sin. So I said, well, that's fine. I said, would you like to be 100% sure you're going to heaven? Well, then I come back and sit them down in the word of God. I get out of the way. See, so what you do is you get them back there, and then they're dealing with this. It's, it's this and him then. And so he opens up their understanding to it. By the way, she did receive Christ. It was awesome. 
just to be a part of it. But she said, yeah, I got a Bible, and I've been reading it for myself. And some of the things in our religion doesn't line up with what the Word of God says. And she'd come back and, and looked at it and was saved. You have to get around the question of the real problem. I already said that. And he will straighten out the real problem, and that's the heart. He'll take out that heart of stone and give him a heart of flesh. And it was a young lady. Um, oh, this Mormon family and his family at the South Texas State Fair this year. This is a, a whole family. The man was 68. His wife was 67. He had two sons. And they come up to the booth. And he told me right up front. He said, I've been baptized into the Mormon faith. He said, but there's some things I just can't go. And he said, here lately they've been teaching about Joseph Smith going up on a mountain and meeting Jesus and Moses in New York somewhere. And I didn't even know that. So I'm getting around that. And he said, but some of the things just don't line up. And so I asked him if he was 100% sure he was going to have. He said, no. And I said, would you like to be? He said, yes. Well, I'm thinking him. So he comes back in the booth. Well, they're all right in line. They come right in there and sit down. Him, his wife, and his two sons. I present the gospel. It's like I'm outside looking in sometimes going through the gospel because God just takes over. I may go here or there. And I got through with it. And uh, sure enough, they all four received Christ. And you just, you just don't know where he's working at. So you just cast the seed or you water it. And it's up to him for the increase. So all you have to do is be obedient. Ezekiel 36, 26. I just like this. It's a, a definition of the, uh, of the new birth. I mean, he's talking about Israel here. Uh, but I just like the picture of the new birth he puts here. 36, 26, and probably 27. And I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will take out the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. That's a good definition of the new, the new birth. Uh-huh. Uh, 36, 26, and 27. Now, he's talking about the, the Israel here when they come back into the land. So you have to change the heart, and then that changes everything. And you'd be surprised how fast it takes place. At Orange at the Holiday in the Park, there was a lady coming in the booth, and she was Latino. She walked through the booth. She was 37. And... Um, so she comes through the board and she looks at it and she said, you know, I've been searching for the truth. And so I bring her in the divine appointments. He's setting it up. So I bring her in the back, lead her through the scriptures and give her the gospel. And she receives Christ. She's elated. She just went on and on. And so we're sitting there talking about another 15 minutes. And about different various things about the Bible and the walk. And she goes, oh, no, it's not going to work. And I said, what do you mean it's not going to work? You mean your new birth? She said, oh, no. She said, I'm living with my boyfriend. It's not going to work anymore. Now, we didn't even discuss that. How did she know? She knew because Jesus put her spirit within here. Now, this is not right. She knew it, and that's just 15 minutes after she was born again. So you get in here and change his heart. That changes a person. It's not about the, the pornographers, the abortionists, all this. All you have to do is get around the intellect, get to the problem of sin and the heart of stone. You give them the gospel, then Jesus comes in here, and he changes them from the inside out. That's the only way it works. See, our nature, for, nature forms us. Sin deforms us. Schools inform people. Prisons reform people from the outside in by oppression, but only Christ can come inside somebody and transform, transform them into a new creation. What did he say? If any man be in me, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. 
That's 2 Corinthians 5.17. The last one, the atheist test. If I get this one right. This is from Adrian Rogers. And he was a pastor at Merritt Island next to the Kennedy Space Center. Well, one day he said he was sitting in his office and this big Cadillac pulled in the driveway. The man got out and he come in. Asked the secretary if he could speak to the pastor. He said, sure. So he went in. Started talking to Adrian. He said, you know, I got a problem. He said, my wife wants to kill herself and I don't want her to. He said, would you talk to her? And he said, yeah. He said, only if you come with her. He said, okay. So about a week goes by. And he sets an appointment. They come in. They sit, he sits them down. He starts talking to the woman. Come to find out, this man is a drunkard. He's a wife beater. He's running around with his wife. You name it. And he's using foul language. So he says, well, I see inside himself. He said, I see the problem. It's him. So he just stops talking to her and starts talking to him. He said, sir, are you a Christian? He starts laughing. He said, no, I'm an atheist. And Adrian says, well, an atheist is somebody who knows there's no God. He said, do you know there's no God? He said, yeah. He said, well, tell me, out of everything there is to know, do you know half of everything there is to know? He said, would you say it would be generous if I said you knew half of everything there is to know? He said, yeah, that's generous. He said, well, how do you know God doesn't exist in the 50% of the knowledge you don't have? He said, oh, you got me. He said, I'm not an atheist. I'm an agnostic. Well, the Latin equivalent to agnostic is ignoramus. It just means you're ignorant of the fact. You don't know whether there's a God or not. Actually, it's just a fancy word for a doubter. He said, yeah, I'm a doubter and a big one. He said, well, I really don't care what size. I want to know what kind. He said, well, what do you mean what kind? He said, well, there's two kinds of doubters. There's honest doubters and dishonest doubters. Which one are you? He said, well, what's the difference? He says, an honest doubter wants to know. Therefore, he makes an honest investigation. A dishonest doubter don't want to know. He can't find God for the same reason a thief can't find a policeman. Jesus said, they hate the light and will not come to light. At least their deeds should be exposed. He said, which one are you? He said, well, I'd like to be honest. And Adrian said, well, tell me, would you sign this statement? God, I don't know whether you exist or not. I don't know if the Bible is your word or not. I don't know if Jesus is your son or not, but I want to know. And because I want to know, I'll make an honest investigation. And because it's an honest investigation, I'll follow the results of that investigation regardless of the cost or the consequences. He said, give that to me again. He said, God, I don't know whether you exist or not. I don't know if the Bible is your word or not, but I want to know. And because I want to know, I'll make an honest investigation. And because it's an honest investigation, I'll follow the results of that investigation, regardless of the cost or the consequences. He said, you surrender your will to God, and he'll show you. We, quote, we looked at that verse a while ago. What was it? John 20, 30, and 31. Jesus did many miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples that are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. He said, I want you to read the book of John. He said, yeah, but I don't believe. He said, well, it was written that you may believe. He said, and then Jesus threw out one of the greatest challenges in all the Bible. In John chapter 7, verses 16 and 17, he says, my doctrine is not mine but his who sent me. If anyone wills to do his will, he shall know concerning the doctrine, whether it be from God or whether I speak of my own authority. If it's your will to do his will, you shall know. That's one of the greatest challenges in the Bible. He said he left. He said, I'll read the book of John. So he went home and he read it. Two weeks later, he come back and gave his heart to Christ. If you surrender your will to God and you read John, He'll open your understanding to it. I've seen it happen. Just like the guy in John 3.16. He said, you just can't smoke John 3.16. So you just never know. But what you have to do, just get around all the problems of that questions. 
I mean, oh yeah, agree with them or whatever. You may show them a verse or something that contradicts that. But then you're going to get a debate. And it's not going to work. Because they're going to be on their offensive. But what you have to do is get around that and get to the problem of the heart. And take out that heart of stone and give them a heart of flesh. And when they get born again, see, then they got the law on the inside. And then Jesus is going to transform all that. He's going to take care of all them questions they got. Because when he gets in there, then he's going to clean house. You know, if you're a Christian, you know what I'm talking about. He comes inside and changes you. You're not the same person you were. And I'll have to tell you, if your religion hadn't changed you, you better change your religion and get the Bible kind. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, Lord. You lead God and direct us in paths of righteousness and holiness, Lord. Help us to always do those things that glorify you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for helping me out in my stumbling and bumbling. Lord, I just want to glorify you in everything I do say and think in my life and in my death. Lord, so you lead God and direct us to glorify you. Because when I stand before you, Lord, that's the one thing I want to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. Thank you, Jesus. It's in your name I pray. Amen.